Welcome back to week two of uh, our Bible failure series on King David. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you this morning. And our simple prayer once again, open our hearts, our minds, uh, even just our ears, Lord, so that we can hear and receive what the Spirit is saying to the church today. In Jesus' name, help us. Amen. So despite David's humble beginnings, God chooses him as king. He doesn't look the part, but God sees his potential. Perhaps we don't look so great either. Well, I guess I better just speak for myself. <laughs> Few people expect us to amount to much, but God sees our potential. Never give up, never give in, dig in. Well, before we get to uh, David's recovery, we really have to dig into where he stumbled. So let's take a direct look at the adultery he commits. 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. 2 Samuel 11, beginning with verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And so this episode begins with what I would call ancient pornography. David stays back in the palace instead of going out to battle, as the kings of his era were supposed to do. He takes a walk on the roof of his palace, giving him a view of the other rooftops below the palace. You know, it is more likely that he knew the wives of his nobles sunbathed at this time of day. Jesus was so right when he raised the standard on sexual faithfulness, saying that if one even looks at another to lust, then he or she has committed adultery in the heart. You know, uh, my adult daughters, they, they often say they are so disappointed in many of the young men that are around their age, even though many in their circles of friends or Christians, it just seems that so many of them have viewed pornography. And sadly, many, even though, again, they might name the name of Jesus, they try to justify it. Again, Jesus was right to say no. David encounters temptation and he gives into it. 2 Samuel chapter 11, continuing with verse 3. 2 Samuel 11, verse 3. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. He enlists his staff to go, go and get Bathsheba for him. How often do we enlist others to support our sin? If our spouse gets us a drink, a joint, or whatever our drug of choice is, then it's okay, right? If he or she watches this stuff with me, it's not like I'm lying. The psychology department would call people who do these things enablers. We must not blame those we recruit to support our sin. 
sin is sin and, and the fact that we might succeed at enlisting people to help us sin doesn't make it any better in fact in some sense it makes it worse because not only are we sinning but we're we're, we're, we're getting people involved in our sin that doesn't that doesn't spread out the blame we, we fully bear our own responsibility. But not only that, if I cause another stumble, I have an added burden of sin. Because not only have I sinned, I've, I've tried to get another to sin with me. We bear our own responsibility just like David Along this vein, as some argue that Bathsheba knew David would be looking. Oh, you know, they're sunbathing at just the time when the king might be looking. They suggest she actively sought to seduce him. And the, the reality, brothers and sisters, is that the Bible doesn't tell us one way or the other. And, and so whatever was in Bathsheba's heart... We really can't know that. And so it is foolish if we were to attempt to create some kind of teaching or doctrine based on what we think might have been. The Bible doesn't tell us uh, about Bathsheba's sin. It tells us about David's sin. And so that's where we'll focus. And by the way, by today's standards, David would be charged with rape. As king, he was in a position of power and authority. Bathsheba may well have been an unwilling victim who feared for her life and for her family's safety. Who knows what the threat was if she disobeyed a king. And so not only is it adultery, but uh, in reality, it's very possible that Bathsheba feared for her life. Adultery is horrific, brothers and sisters, and, and I'm not here to soften it. Uh, I'm not here to offer any kind of mitigation. But I will say this, it is recoverable. Like us, David has sinned badly. How will David solve his problem? It can be recoverable, but David's initial reaction is to make a bad problem worse. David lies. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 5. Second Samuel 11, verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. Remember, Bathsheba was raped. Regardless, too often, when women become pregnant, the dads blame them 100%. She may be the innocent here, but she's at the mercy of David. No wonder we cannot put our trust in people. Instead, we must look to God. Continuing with verse 6, 2 Samuel 11, verse 6. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Again, Bathsheba is pregnant. 
there is a law that I'm very familiar with called PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And as mentioned before, Bathsheba, certainly by the standards of that law, which talks a lot about power dynamics, by the standards of that law, David has raped Bathsheba. Again, he's Israel's king. Uh, and the power differential between David and Bathsheba is just too great. She may have had some choice, but not much. He could have had her whole family killed. Just as there is no consent in prison, it cannot honestly be argued that Bathsheba wanted or even consented to the relationship. Since David was king, this was rape. David tries to get Bathsheba's husband to sleep with her so his adultery can remain secret. But the scripture is so clear. Numbers 32 23 again numbers 32 23 this time from the new living translation but if you fail to keep your word then you will have sinned against the lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out we cover up our stumbles fumbles and fails just like david did I remember reading in high school the Scarlet Letter. In the story, the minister hides his affair with a member of his church. The result is that she suffers terribly. He's, he suffers too. And I kept thinking, why doesn't he just fess up? Supposedly, he's protecting his church members. In reality, he's trying to protect himself. And in a deeper reality, he's generating greater suffering for both himself and his mistress. Lying is often worse than the sin that's being covered up. Where there is trust, so much can be forgiven. Um, I was at a conference once and a uh, police officer from Missouri taught us how to get out of a speeding ticket. So brothers and sisters, if you learn nothing else today, you're going to learn how to get out of a speeding ticket. And, and so uh, you hear the, you hear the siren and you look up and you see the lights and you pull over and, and stop. And the police officer's coming over, and what you need to do is put your hands on the steering wheel uh, in a 10 2 position, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And then the police officer will likely ask you for your driver's license uh, and your registration. And you say to the officer, all right, officer, I'm going to take my right hand and I'm going to reach into the glove compartment and get the registration. Uh, is that OK? And, and, you know, he'll nod. And so you without making any sudden motions, you open the drawer, and you get the registration, hand it to him and you say, now I'm going to take my uh, left hand and I'm going to reach into my pocket and get my driver's license and you pull it out. And, and again, without any sudden motions, you hand it to him. And then he might say, um, you know, do, do you realize how fast you were going? And you say, yes, officer, I realize I was 15 or 20 miles over the speed limit, whatever it was. I, I am so sorry. I, I wasn't paying close attention. I got caught up in the music. Uh, totally understand if you need to give me a ticket today. Your hands are in the 10-2 position on the steering wheel. And so generally what will happen then is the officer will go back to his car and what he's thinking is, this driver hasn't lied to me, understands what they've done wrong. And not only that, the driver has done everything possible to make me feel safe, to make me as a police officer understand that I'm going to go home tonight and see my wife and children because they're not going to do anything dangerous. They, they have showed me that they are safe. And he said, more often than not, 
The police officer will return, hand the license and the registration, and say, today I'm going to give you a warning. Uh, please slow down. Have a nice day. And the officer said he's got many uh, emails and phone calls saying that, you know, it's not that they went out to speed on purpose, but it happened. And they did what they were told. And sure enough, they got a warning. It's not a guarantee, but why did the police officer choose to give a warning instead of a ticket with a penalty? And the answer is... Uh, there was humility, there was repentance, uh, and there was an owning of the problem, an, an owning of the sin. Uh, there was no lying, there was no covering up, and most of the time, uh, the result is forgiveness. So what have we said today? David starts great. God really uses him and takes care of him. David reaches an incredible assignment, king of Israel. Then David commits a career-ending sin, adultery. We often think that once we're Christians, we'll never sin again. At least not really bad. When it happens, we figure we're done. God can't use us anymore. We'll be, we'll be lucky if we can just make it to heaven. And today's encouragement is that our God is a master at turnarounds. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to, uh, Lord, come to you in sincerity and honesty without uh, hiding anything and, and to just be real with you, especially where we've sinned, where we failed. And God, what we know is you'll redeem us and you will empower us to greater service. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come back next week, brothers and sisters, for the conclusion of our series on King David. God bless you real good.